You know, there's nothing like cracking that, that cellophane and pulling that record out. It just smells great. Welcome to Buzz Mayhem Hour. Non-stop hardcore energy. I love the show, guys. You're awesome. Unlike any other. With your host, John the Bod, a.k.a. The Bodfather. Man, this stuff rocks. Hi, I'm Gwen. And I'm Sean. And we're from the band Frail. And you are watching Bod's Mayhem Hour. The views and opinions of the guests do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of Bod's Mayhem Hour, its staff, affiliates, or sponsors. Parental discretion is advised. Welcome to Bod's Mayhem Hour. Hey everybody, welcome to Bod's Mayhem Hour. I am your host, John the Bod, a.k.a. the Bod Father. And as always, I'm bringing you guys and gals awesome interviews. But before I introduce today's awesome guest on the podcast, please go out to YouTube, look up Bod's Mayhem Hour, click the notification bell, subscribe. Because you definitely want to keep with all these interviews that I'm doing. we got some awesome, awesome stuff coming down the pop. And uh, please, please get out and support the uh, Eastern Kentucky Flood Relief Fund. Because every little bit counts, and we all need that here in Eastern Kentucky for sure. So without further ado, my guest today on the podcast is vocalist Gwen String and guitarist Sean Belifke. I told you I'd screw that up, Sean. Uh, <laughs> oh, my God. Belifke formerly of this disengage uh they're from the band frail and i'm telling you this right now folks you are not going to be sorry that you check this band out because they have some fucking great great music they hail from cleveland ohio and they will release their new album skin and sorrow september 23rd via aqua lamb records skin and sorrow is the follow-up to their debut album titled 1692 released in 2020 and check out previous singles I hope I say this right, Trickle and Revenge and Skin and Sorrow. And check out them live September 9th at the Post Festival. So I hope I got everything in there for you guys. So how you guys doing? Yeah. <laughs> We're good, man. Thank you so yeah, much for having thanks us. Thanks for having us. Yeah, not a problem. I, I am hooked on your guys' music in the past two months. I'm going to say that straight up right now. Um, I, I've watched the live at the house of wheels oh my god man your guys music is so damn good i don't even know it's just yeah, it's mind-blowing i'm just gonna say that straight up so kudos first of all for what y'all have done so far thank you thank you yeah. so much thank you so much what's your thoughts on recently signing to the oracle management that's globally represented by of course des and anastasia for how do you guys uh think of this man and your thoughts on it I mean, they've been amazing. It's it's really nice when you get to work with somebody who truly believes in you and what you're trying to do. They have been extremely supportive and you can tell they really believe in us. And um, that just makes everything go, you know, smoothly. They, they've definitely gotten some big inroads for us. They, um, get us on the cradle self tour uh i mean just everything we just love them yeah i mean like like Glenn said they, they they believe in us and you know we can tell them i think as a as a band coming up that's the most important thing you can do is try to surround yourself by people that believe in you whether it's labels management booking agent anything like that because but that's really at the end of the day the most important thing and especially when you have Des Fafaro that's with devil driver who you know, if, if you catch the tension of his eye and he wants you on his label, you're doing something correct, you know? So that's, that's even better. Yeah. I mean, we were fans before. Yeah. We yeah. Cole signed. Chamber yeah. and Devil Driver. And, you know, that guy's done it twice. Yep. You know, not everybody can do it twice. So when you do it twice, he knows what he's doing. So we, we listen to it. Did you feel a little nervous at the time when you both knew this was the right fit when creating this evil haunting monster frail? Was you guys a little nervous at the beginning of started to work on all this at the beginning? Um, well, I think that when we first started this, it was, it just kind of happened. Um, I bought Sean logic for Christmas one year and it just kind of reignited his love for writing music. And he would hear me sing in the bathtub. We're a couple, uh, <laughs> by the way. Um, he would hear me sing in the bathtub and, and basically forced me to um, sing on a couple of covers that he'd um, recorded. 
So when we um, put out the first EP, White Witch, when we released it on Bandcamp, honestly, we had zero expectations. We were just hoping that we would make, you know, $10 a month to cover the cost of, of Bandcamp, you know? So we really had zero expectations. Um, so we weren't frightened. We just kind of stumbled into it and um, it's been amazing. Yeah, I don't know if it was stumbled so much. Like we, you know, we knew that we wanted to work on, you know, when you look at Bandcamp, when we first started, we, we looked at it and we thought, okay, you're looking at 35 squares on your screen every time you scroll and then it refreshes. So how does, how can you not only, you know, do the music, but also visually try to grab attention when you are just competing against squares on the screen, right? So that that kind of set us off visually, you know, to, to, to push it just as hard as the music originally. Um, and like Glenn said, we, we didn't think any was, we didn't know and really didn't care. We just wanted to do it for ourselves. We like, just wanted to have a project that we could do together. Yeah, we just gave ourselves a deadline, and, and which was April 1st of 2018, and we put it up. And then the next morning, we had a dollar. Yeah. It was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> it sold a song. Within a week, we uh, had an email from uh, what is now our European record label, Lay Bear Recordings, uh, Desiree, who's been so instrumental in helping us grow. But she you know, said, hey, are you working with anybody? If not, I'd love to put your record out. And we were like, what? <laughs> and then six months later, we were playing festivals, festivals in, Europe. in Europe. Yeah, so wow. we had to get a band together, and it was kind of crazy how it all, you know, happened. But I guess we got nervous when it got more real when we yeah. had to go to Europe. But putting it out, no. So when you left Disengage, and now you started with this with Gwen, did this fuel your fire to say, "I, I want back in this. I've got stuff that I need to get out myself personally." Absolutely. I didn't play music for like ten years. Wow. You know, and I just started drinking a lot and. Uh, you know, I, I think alcohol has a really detrimental effect on some people. And I was one of them, but didn't know it, you know, for a long time. And so when Gwen got me logic, um, you know, I got excited about music again, but I also just coincidentally quit drinking at the same time. So I had all this nervous energy that had to go somewhere. So I just freaked out, on it, you know, and I played bass and disengaged, but I'd always, you know, wanted to play guitar. Uh, I still don't know what those top two strings on the guitar do, but, <laughs> <laughs> um, so it, it just reignited everything. And so the, the not drinking and having logic again, and then having a, a girl singer, which I've, you know, never had a project that had a, a girl singer, you know, like when um, it was awesome. And it's been a learning experience of how to work together on, on music because disengage was so different, but I try to just keep all the aggression and stuff that I did and disengage on my side and then let Gwen do whatever she wants on hers. Like initially I tried to, Oh, sound like this or try this. And then it, it just sounded bad. So she just does her own thing. And it, that's what frail is. Has this brought you guys closer together as a couple? Ooh, at times. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to say overall, for sure, um, that we have this one common goal. But we um, we do bicker a lot <laughs> over it. I think it, like we both do our parts separately. So he'll write a riff and then he'll put it in a folder and then I'll go up by myself and look at the folder and write a melody and then we'll kind of get together and arrange it. And, and uh, so, but we do work very separately, but I think that is good because like Sean said, he came from this super aggressive, you know, hard rock kind of background. And I came from Gothic, you know, dance, you know, dance music, not, not EBM or anything like that, but you know, heavy goth, like, yeah. You know, it's Arab, you know, sisters of mercy, um, Bauhaus, and of course, like things like Portishead and the Cranes. Um, so I came at it from a completely different angle. So if we're trying to work on it together, we kind of butt heads. But if we just do our own things separately, it kind of works. So yeah, usually the melodies that she does that I either don't like or can't figure out at first are the ones that stick and are the best. And that ends up being frail. Because in the beginning, I was like, no, you know, this blues kind of stuff and sing about wizards and skies. And <laughs> yeah. It sounded like it just a girl singing Caius softly so I was like it's not gonna it's no good so then she just did her own thing and that's that's, that's the way to do it so I, we get out of each other's way yeah. I guess uh, but for so she said we bicker which we do like when we're at home and recording and stuff but for some reason on the road which is more stressful I think than home stuff we get along Golden. awesome yeah that's <laughs> it's weird the opposites <laughs> yeah, yeah. So how excited are you both to release this new album skin and sorrow because i know it has to be you know just itching to get this thing out finally and be done with it and move on 
For sure. I mean, we, it's been finished for more than a year. Wow. You know, it's vinyl is that backed up It's it's been finished for, yeah, for more than a year. So we, you know, we want to unleash it <laughs> onto the world, but what can you do? You yeah. know, you just have to kind of, and we're still having problems with getting the vinyl. So it's not like we're sitting on it and waiting. No, we still don't have it. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, fr- it's very frustrating. Yeah. Out of our control. But yeah. so what we could do in the meantime is have an abnormally long lead up to the record with like you know, <laughs> singles and videos coming out. Cause we, you know, we do all the video stuff ourselves too. So it gave us more time to focus on that. So, and you know, we're going to have another one done prior to the release. So that's four singles and four videos that are pretty, you know, involved video shoots that we've done in the meantime. So we didn't just kind of sit on our hands, but it was just waiting and waiting and waiting. And sure. the response we've been getting so far to, to the latest single bright eyes is like, finally it's starting to, okay, people are getting it and people are getting into it. So we're finally starting to, you know, feel some momentum with, for the new record coming up. So like, we're just super eager to get the whole thing out there. Yeah. And then you guys even had to push the album back. You know, that, yeah, was, yeah. that was crazy. I was like, wow, this band has been through shit with this, with this release. Yeah. 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 But it looks like it's going to hopefully bear hopefully fruit. We don't have it yeah. yet. So let's knock on wood that yeah, yeah. it will actually happen. But... <laughs> yeah. All right, so I want to ask this because I thought this was when I was writing this down and, I, and the way you guys do your music is is fucking phenomenal. I love how this fits everything. But Frail is known for its haunting lyrics and dark tones, but what makes this sound so unique and stands out more for this band musically than, say, other, I don't know, Doom, Sludge, whatever band you want to call to fit in, but what makes this band's music stand out more and be more unique, if that makes sense? I actually was thinking about this the other day and I think that I termed the phrase, I think we're do, we're gloom. <laughs> so we're kind of, we're kind of gothic doom, but I, I think the reason that it's different is because like I said previously, Sean and I are coming at it from such different points of view and mm. histories and, and musical backgrounds. And the fact that we do our things separately so that we're not colored by the other's influences like he wrote a riff I was listening to and sang on just yesterday and I was like this sounds like straight up crowbar you know like this Fuck is yeah it does <laughs> <laughs> you know and then I do like a little lilting portisetti something over top and that's I think that's what makes it different yeah and from my standpoint you know musically on, on let's say on my side there's like this stone and rock crowbar doom stuff one side portis head goth and in the middle is this secret love that we both have for like 90s new metal. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a lot of like rhythm and stuff they do with not a lot of notes, but it's more rhythm and like bob your head kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. So you mix all those things together. And I think that's frail. And from what I can see out there in the world, like with sludgy doom bands or, or stoner doom bands or whatever, it's more blues oriented or just a lot of drone fuzz and there's not that bop and like i, I don't want to say fun because that's not the right word but i don't know energy or something that we have to it and then you throw one on drive, top. drive drive yes yeah. that's a good word but yeah so that you put on top and then also we spent a lot of time on our verses making our verses sound just as interesting as the choruses um with you know i think one of the themes that i had in my mind for skin and sorrow was i wanted a lot of the verses to sound like they were loops of something but there's no loops involved. It's all guitars going through timed effects and, you know, whatever. But I wanted it to sound as if it was uh, machine even though it was all organic and, and made by guitars. And that, that gets a little tricky to do live sometimes, but, you know, we pull it off. Um, so, I, I, you know, I, I don't know if there's other doom bands out there trying to do those kind of things. Yeah. So there's kind of like Easter eggs, as I call them, like you find in movies. There are little Easter eggs in these songs that you guys have to say, oh, there's some new metal. Oh, there's some art, rock, rock, rock and roll there. Yeah. And I think a lot of that comes from the luxury of having our own studio. So we sure. you know, yeah. have all the time we want to do. And everything's on and ready to go. And it's the same sounds on on a record as if you just turn it on. So it's, you know, if we write something like it that day, it'll stick. And then like there's some songs that are written over nine months, you know, and the, the guitars are nine months apart, but they sound very similar and still go together. So a lot of Easter eggs happen. You have that much time. 
<laughs> what led the song Skin and Sorrow to be the first track released off this upcoming album? Because I know there's other bangers on here that could easily been the first one. But what led this one to say that's got to be the first one? Um, to me, I think it's one of two that have the most feeling and meaning for me. So during COVID, I had a, a lot of losses. I'm sure a lot of us did. Um, and that song was just straight out stream of consciousness pain, you know, and there's another song, Perfect Wound. Always, I, we renamed it, so I always forget the name of that one. But um, those two were little, literally written the night of and the day after someone uh, close to me died. So um, I wanted to get that out, like, personally, I wanted to get that out there to just act, just get it out and get it done with. Um, because, you know, when you're being that vulnerable in front of all these people, it's really, it's, it's difficult, you know? And so if you pull it off like a Band-Aid, to me, it was, it's, my way was kind of easier to deal with it. I, and I think that musically, you know, you have, you have the meaning that, you know, I feel too from that song and musically it wasn't like a, a barn burner right off the bat so we didn't want to kind of we knew this the lead up was going to be longer and not as long as it was but so when we put that out we didn't want to put out like a, a barn we wanted to kind of build with the singles that we released and and put a song out there that we that is more to me songy as a it's like meaning like verse choruses and it's like chorus that jumps out and a lot whole lot of melody in there um and say okay this is what we're doing now and then the next release with Treacle was way more about like just, sonic aggression. Yeah. This is what we're doing now. And then Bright Eyes is here's what we're really doing now. You know, kind of, so we're kind of like leading up to the the record coming out with singles that are showing, I guess, layer by layer where we're at as a band. To me, they're com they're three completely different feelings. Yeah. Like, yeah. And songwriting. I mean, yeah. everything riffs. Everything about them is different. Yeah. Writing on this new album, Skin and Sorrow, did, did you feel a little pressure to outdo the debut 1692? Or did you say, just no, let's just do our thing and, and just leave 1692 back here? I think that's always there a little bit, but right. we try to get that out yeah, of our heads. And yeah, just focus on doing the best we can with what we're interested in at that time. Because again, having the studio here, I mean, I'm in there every day, pretty much six days a week. You know, riffs, just learning about, you know, more about it, the gear, what I can get out of it, you know, that kind of stuff, comparing mixes to other bands, like all that kind of stuff, just learning and, and soaking it all in. So it's much more about pushing that, our ability, than it is trying to outdo what we did before, you know, and, and we just want to have fun. Like we're, if it feels like work, we usually bail on it. Like it's something I learned early on in life. Like when I used to like skateboard or snowboard, if I was having a bad day, I just, fail and come back tomorrow because it's like you just get more frustrated and look yourself in a hole and that i think when you try to outdo yourself that's what can happen you, you back yourself into you a put corner yourself a, a lot of pressure yeah. yeah and so we try to just come at it fun because that's when the best songs happen you know i don't think the best songs really come from when you're fucking stressed especially self-induced stress plus i think that when you're in it um so when you first write a a, a, a sketch um, you're like, oh my God, this is the best thing I've ever heard, ever. It's the most incredible thing. Every single one of them. Every single one of them. And then <laughs> when you're done, you're like, I don't want to hear this shit forever. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So it's, you know, you, it's different in the moment than it is. And then you kind of even up. Like, okay, this is good. But yeah, we, like, when we finish something, when we finish something, you know, we listen to it a zillion times in the car, on these speakers, on those speakers, on headphones. And then we go back and we polish and we, you know, rearrange. So you're just so fucking sick of it. At oh, least. yeah. Yeah, because we mix and master everything ourselves, too. So it's just done. Yeah, done by the end of it. I, I couldn't imagine it. I mean, I love and eat, breathe, sleep music. But I, you know, I would be just like you guys. Okay, it's done. I'm fucking tired of it. <laughs> Let's go. Yeah, like today, today I had to force myself not to do anything. I just needed a day to do nothing. Yeah. And so I was like, I'm not, you know, it's just embedded in me to walk upstairs and get in the studio and turn everything on but i was like no today i'm watching youtube all day long i don't care <laughs> <laughs> are these all brand new songs or songs that didn't make the previous album or maybe songs that's in the vault from you guys possibly they're all new right 
I think they were, I think they were all new. I know that Sean wrote the riff for Treacle and all the things I was on the same day. And it just blew my mind. Like those are probably my two favorite songs on the album. Uh, Treacle is by far my favorite song on the album. Um, I don't know what he was smoking that day, but it was <laughs> amazing. And I need to get him more of it. <laughs> I don't think anything. I usually don't do anything with it. Which is weird. I think most people get wasted to play guitar, but I don't do that. Um, Bright Eyes was a, it's actually a collaboration. There was a, there's this dude and he lives in Greece now. I think he was in UK when he wrote it, but he, he writes really, really good, um, like sludge metal riffs, um, mm -hmm. but has like a depth tones approach to it. Amazing. And we were on Instagram and I was following him and the riff for King Midnight. You didn't say that. Oh, I didn't? No. Oh, King Midnight. Sorry. <laughs> um, and we were on Instagram one day and I came across that riff, the main riff for Bright Eyes. And I was like, what the fuck is it? Like, I loved it so much. So I messaged him and I was like, you know, this riff is awesome. Um, it, it's different from what we do, but for some reason it just feels so right. Um, you know, can we use this riff? And he's like, sure. You know, just make sure to not say that you wrote it. So, <laughs> so mm -hmm. King Manette wrote it. And then, you know, I did the bridge and the, uh, the verses and then Gwen did all the lyrics and everything. But the, that was that was exciting for me because it's like collaborating with someone completely outside my usual suspects of, you know, blues or crowbar or this or that. And I think that was really felt exciting, I guess, like, you know, which doesn't, when you played guitar and wrote riffs for 30 years, you don't really get excited that often. You know what I mean? So this was, this was exciting. Gwen, I want to know this because your lyrics are so good and the way you sing and structure it is so good, but how do you, put that into your lyrics because you know a lot of people do their standard their standard songs you know just regular vocal stuff like that but it sounds like i mean you're singing it but it's like you're just like reading it you know what i'm saying it's, it's like a story being told actually i like how you bring your vocals on this so talk about that a little bit how does this you know want it to be different this way than say others sure oh thanks um i mean the the lyrics normally start from like, I have a library of thousands of lyric notes, whether it be a word or a phrase or something like that. And then that just kind of, uh, when it comes time to, you know, writing the lyrics for the songs, because I write the melodies first and then I have to kind of go back and figure out, okay, maybe this, I like this kind of phrase and it fits into it. And then I kind of just write the rest of the lyrics. Um, I don't, and it's funny because I don't ever write lyrics taking into consideration that, oh, I want a long O here, or I want a, you know, long E here, because that would sound great. I, I probably should, um, but to me, you know, because it would make my life easier, but to me that kind of uh, would interrupt like the storytelling and, and getting my point across and, and, you know, trying to break someone's heart through through words and melody you know and um so i don't really have a mind to that when when i write that stuff but you know i know that the, the pros do any tracks that did not make this album we're going to see on another ep or another album down the road from you guys possibly did you save anything back that didn't make it don't really need to. I mean, we already have a folder with 30 things that we're working on yeah, for the next for one. The next so. <laughs> it's like the, when I say I'm in there six days a week, I am. And we have and that, that folder of the 30 we're working on is just the ones that we call selects. Like oh, wow. there's probably 80 or 90 that didn't even get into the you know pool just for this record. So we don't really like it's not like we're starved for songs. We're like we had eleven of them and we only used ten of them. So we have we're gonna use this next one and the next one. We don't really operate that way. Sometimes we'll go back and listen, but usually we're just at a different space and you know i think that's how the records are evolving right. you know and how we pick yeah. and and then like while we do pick some that he's got in his library and he's a very prolific uh writer but you know when we're in it and we're like okay no i think you know this is leaning more towards this so let's write some more stuff for this and for the last two records both times he's come up with a new song that he thinks has to be included on the record. Like Fuck yeah, it does. a couple of weeks before <laughs> it's due. <laughs> so that's fun. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. So like we have the 30 we're working with right now, but I'm still adding to it. Cause you know, I'm, I'm, Oh, I'm on a different kick right now. And I think this feels more right. And I'm getting more excited about this. So it's, uh, it's, it's probably a pain in the ass to deal with me all mm -hmm. the time. <laughs> Cause I'm like, 
just twitch and, ah, and riffs <laughs> and songs. Um, but yeah, so nothing, nothing held back because why do that? Right. John is AKA Butters from South Park. Oh. Yeah, that's the <laughs> Butters. That's the dad. Yeah, he's a, yeah. He's but, a, yeah, that's when he drinks coffee in the morning. I oh, tell him he wow. vibrates. Yeah. Because he's, he's just like, let's do this and this. And I'm like, I am like waking up and I need another hour. <laughs> Yeah, I get up earlier than she does. So yeah. by like, if I have coffee and shit by like 9 a.m., I'm going hard. Mm. She's not even up. No. <laughs> I, I'm right there, Gwen. No way. Uh uh-uh. uh. Right? I got to get up six o'clock anyway for work. And then on my days off, you best not call me. Yeah. <laughs> ass up. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> was there a track on this album that you were working on that totally ended up sounding different than it was intended to? Was there one that just kept changing or no? Um, I think, well, what was the one where I'm really gulping the chorus? Is that Stars or no. Song for the Dead? Maybe it's Stars. Yeah. So there's a song, Stars, where Gwen actually yells for the first time in Frail. In life. Mm. No, that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, so she got loud. And I don't think you're, you don't like that sounding voice. No. I think it sounds rad because it sounds like... Um, it's kind of like Susie and the Banshees if she, when she would yell, yell. Like, to me, that's what it sounds like. So we, we have that, and I was, you know, told to bury it in the mix. <laughs> but it's still in there. So that one, I think, is different because, you know, we never, she never says, I'm going to yell in this one. You know, but the chorus just wasn't popping and it wasn't doing stuff. I'm like, try to just just yell, please. And, <laughs> and then she did it, and, like, we really liked it. So that, that one, which we haven't released yet, is, is probably pretty pretty different. Um, and what started yeah and then uh else? maybe perfect wound with the chorus with the hula chorus yeah there's yeah there's always these light like sometimes we'll we just need a little oomph but that little oomph ends up being like 16 additional tracks yeah. of layering so that was wow like, uh, what happened there. Um, i'm really stoked on the song ipecac which is on there um eric the the previous bass player that we had um he wrote uh he, he would sent some, some some sketches in and the the verse of that song, I freaking love it. And it reminds me of like 90s hard rock-ish new metal. It's just super chill. Like I want to drive around my car with the window down listening to it, which just doesn't really happen with rail that often. So <laughs> yeah, there's, I'm stoked on that one. And, and that one ended up, I guess, I ended up feeling differently about it after hearing the whole thing. And her, her, the vocal melody that she does is like bouncy over top of it, which is real cool. You guys said this was recorded at your own studio in your home there. Do you, do you like having the freedom to do it when you want to do it and, you know, do it yourself? Or do you want a producer eventually, or do you like just doing it on your own? So Gwen has never been, like, with Disengage and my other bands, like, we would, you know, if you go to a studio, you have a day or two to get your vocals done. And you're just, pow, 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 going for it. You know, and that, that, when, unless you have a big budget. I know we never had a big budget. So that, that can be intimidating and you don't really get the best result out of that. So having the ability for her to just go hoo-ha a day and then the next day she can be, and just whenever she wants to. And the same with me on riffs and going back and tweaking has been crucial, I think, oh, in the, to what the sure. end result yeah. of frail is. Yeah. I don't think there would be a frail if we um, had to start out with going into the studio. Now, now, you know, I don't know. Um, I still love how we do it. It, it. It's comfortable, you know. You're it's just me and the computer, and Sean and his guitar and the computer, and you know, it's it's pretty sweet and low pressure, and yeah, I just I love it. I don't think I would change anything. Yeah, I mean, if we got to a certain level and there was a budget involved, and there was a producer that we were going to learn a whole bunch from, and they were going to bring a lot to the table. But that would have to be such a high level producer um, to, yeah. I guess, get us interested in that, that I don't, you know, hopefully we'll get there someday. Like, I'm a big fan of like maybe producers that aren't so much into heavy music and, you know, like Mutt Lang and what he did with Def Leppard and ACDC, I think is incredible. And so I try to emulate like that approach to production with us and that, but you know, that's so far above like what I think we'd probably have access to. So. <laughs> But if it ain't broke, don't fix it, man. If it ain't broke, don't yeah. Fix it. I mean, no one's no one's complaining about the way I record. That'd be so broke. What's the growth musically you've seen from yourselves working on this new album versus the White Witch EP? 
or just in the band's music in general from from that EP till now? What what's you've seen? What have you seen in the the band's growth possibly? Well, I think me personally, I was so insecure hmm. um, about singing, and it you know I think you know just you can hear it in my vocals. I held back a lot on the first one, and it's even probably the first couple of songs maybe that we recorded on this on oh sorry on 1692 but this one feels a lot more I feel a lot more confident and comfortable same thing with um playing live I mean you know here's this person who's never sung in front of anybody in her life and then oh by the way you know you're gonna play Desert Fest and Soul Pressure yeah, those are our first shows. I was, I was scared <laughs> to death. I was scared to death. And I spent a mm. lot of time like trying to hide more than trying to just emote and feel. And uh, yeah, so the, whoever was at those shows, I'm sorry. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> Come again. I promise it will be better. Um, yeah, we've grown a lot. I yeah. think live is, you know, feeling her confidence and, Night and day. especially the last Cradle Tour we did. Um, which, you know, we were a little like, what is their audience going to think of us? You know, these are big rooms and lights and stage, you know, big stage and everything. So it was, you know, we're, we, we have played big stages in Europe, but in the U.S. it's mainly just clubs. So this is our first big stage U.S. consecutive, you know, mm-hmm. pack rooms kind of thing. And that was, okay, here we go. What's going to happen? And we, you know, I, I know what it feels like from Disengage and other bands to just put my head down and give it, you know, but this band the crowd doesn't give it back to you when the band is freaking out on stage and doing, you know, hard rock, aggressive stuff. The band, the, the crowd doesn't care. The crowd's watching her and eating every word that she says to them. So it really comes down to her confidence in what she's doing. And I think that what she's learned, you know, prior to leading up to Cradle and then just reinforcing that every night on Cradle, the Cradle Tour was, you know, really important for us as a live band. And then I think that's what, you know, now it's, for the next step we're working on, I think, is translating into the, the studio. Because it, it's a weird thing when you're a band and you're used to giving it, and the crowd's like, yeah, you're crazy. And so now we give it, and the crowd goes, they don't move unless she's doing something. You know? <laughs> Pretty cool. But what was the gut feeling, though, Gwen, when you were going up to the mic that first time live? I mean, when you were about ready to say, I got to throw up, I'm not doing this. Oh, God, what the fuck have I done? I, so... <laughs> kind of a funny story so we found so we released the album and um our label contacted us and they're like you know you have to come do the festivals in in europe we're like oh shit, okay so sean was like look i want to get us a show you know like early tuesday night we'll open for somebody it'll be you know really laid back i just want you to get you know your sea legs kind of thing yeah. okay that sounds good so then he comes back and we're headlining a Saturday night. And I'm like, what? I think you- it was a Friday. But Friday still. Night. What did you do to me? So our first show was like a headline show. In my defense, I called our club and I was like, hey, man, Sean disengaged. We, we got a new band. We would just want to do a Tuesday in front of nobody. Don't have to pay us. And the, the guy that books it was just used to disengage. I was like, okay, yeah, no problem, Sean. And then here's your show. So you're headlining on Friday. And we're like, what the fuck? So yeah, so, I, I took a Xanax. I didn't ask for it. <laughs> yeah. I, I took a Xanax and I kind of I think as long as for me as long as I'm prepared for the worst I can kind of get through it so it's like okay you know am I going to forget the lyrics am I going to fuck this up and um, so I think we did okay in that very first show and then our first stage in Europe the first festival big stage that she did uh, you know she has we have in-ears in your monitors and she got stuck up she's like in her outfit, I'm she very, gets stuck yeah. on everything. Like I'm her <laughs> handler. To like, she falls on people. She falls on steps. Like thought... inclines are a really big deal. Oh, so <laughs> anyway, so we're we're going on stage and the band's out of there, and I'm like, where the fuck is Gwen? And she got stuck on a curtain or some shit. And so she comes walking out like a, you know, 10, 15 seconds later, which is, doesn't sound like a long time, but in like live show time, that's a long oh, time. But yeah. where is this person? And so she comes out and the crowd goes, yeah. And so it was like she did an entrance. And I was like, well, that's new. I've been playing for a long time and done a lot of tours and I've never had that happen before. So we'll start doing that. You know, so a lot of these things we kind of like learned as we went. And so then on the Cradle Tour, we would do this thing where the band comes out, we fog the shit out of it. We have all these lights that backlight us. 
And then we go into the first song, and Gwen's not even out there. So the crowd, the cradle crowd, who's never saw us before, was like, what's going on? And then Gwen makes her entrance, and the whole place goes fucking nuts. Wow. And I don't even have to look up to know when she's coming out. I have my head down. I can just hear everybody go crazy because they're she walks out, and it's just, you know, her outfits are always on point. She's yeah. always got a lot of a lot of shit going on up here that looks <laughs> <laughs> sometimes there's lights. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I think that that crowd who was there to see, you know, Cradle and Danny Filth and that character-driven, you know, music is like, okay, here's another character. We don't know this band, but I, I, I'm picking up what they're putting down. You know, so yeah. those are the kind of things that we learned. And then she got more confident and then she just comes out there and slowly, ju- like her feet don't move. She just slowly, it's all wrists. <laughs> and she slowly gestures and points to people and they're just like getting pulled into by a tractor beam. It's like, it's crazy. But I think for me, like I'm not one of those singers that looks over everybody's heads and just kind of, you know, I'm looking you dead in your eyes and we're going to have a moment and we're going to exchange energy and you know and so that's what i love and need and it's like it's live it's a totally spiritual experience for me oh yeah now, you know it before it was like Ugh. scared shitless yes yeah, scared. um but yeah now it's it's very spiritual to me and it takes me to another place and i'm just like you know exchanging blessings with the audience and just kind of giving it energy it's 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 amazing it feels like a if you feel high your stage presence is is huge um because if nobody can like grasp onto it and pay attention to you and what you guys are doing they've sadly mistakenly missed all this and i think that the band that really brought all this back and i'm not knocking nobody but i think ghost has brought all that back now if that makes sense for the theatrical side of it you know what i'm saying yeah because like you especially you know you're up there and you're doing your you know waving and stuff and pointing and stuff like that that's what a lot of these people want you know they want people moving around of course but when you're making that touch with the crowd oh man they eat that up that's that's yeah. your function. and that, that's you know in disengaged crowds hard rock crowds like we didn't do that you know we didn't do any kind of stuff to really we just gave it to the crowd yeah. you know and internally and kept it internally but gwen reaches out and that's nope that's new you know for us and, and we our job is to just kind of hold the energy down and then our bass player jay's got dreadlocks he's been growing for 23 years in the middle of the floor so that's the second most popular <laughs> person in frail is his hair, is his hair. <laughs> but you know that helps he's got dreads going all over the place so that you know that was uh that kind of like completes everything and then you know our, our drummer is uh super into lighting as well so his his drums actually have lights in them that change to the songs so like the backing tracks go through there and change the lights and the drums so it's like we built this whole you know live show just haphazardly moving forward and now we feel really confident about it to the point where you know any show that we're offered we're like fuck yeah we can we can pull it off and we can deliver you know man if he would have done that live at the house of wheels with his drum set dude that'd have been oh yeah that, that was, was yeah. yeah yeah that was our old drummer. A new drummer now. yeah as we got busier um eric and pat who started with us in the band you know their kids adult lives they, they didn't really have the ability to just oh we're gonna go to europe for three weeks so we're gonna go do this cradle tour and so we had to get people that were you know in the situation where they they could go um so that's uh, eric and pat were in house to wills that video was that was crazy to shoot like that was every single piece of equipment video and recording and gear that we own all trucked into this abandoned funeral home and run off one extension cord because that's the only <laughs> one that can work that was crazy what do you guys hope everyone takes away while listening to this new album skin and sorrow or just any of your guys music in general what do you hope they get from it um we always say that our goal is to be part of the conversation in what's happening in heavy music you know and i think that started with we wanted to be part of the conversation when it comes to like you know, Doom or some of the Sergeant House bands like Chelsea Wolf or Emma Ruth Rundle. And we, from what we see online, you know, we are starting to get part of that conversation. So for me, I think that's always like my goal. You know, I'm not, I don't have any like, I hope people take away from this or whatever. I just want to be, you know, relevant, I guess, when it comes to the music that I care about. And for me, it's the total opposite. So I, because I'm the one writing the lyrics and putting my soul you know bearing my soul for me it's just writing it is exercising my demons and putting it out there is hoping that other people can relate and maybe release 
something, you know, by listening to it or to get, feel, get deep. Sometimes you just want to be sad, you know, and you want to just sit there and just wallow in it for a little bit so that you can get to the other side. So for me, that's what it's all about. It's just moving people and, and helping them. Like I want it to be kind of a sanctuary where you can be, you know, to yourself and, and experience and feel so that because you can't just have toxic positivity and, you know, yeah. walk around with a smile plastered on your face. You have to get through it, to go through it to get through it, you know? Mm-hmm. So I want to help you go through it. Walker answer is way better than my answer. <laughs> That's why you guys make a good, be a good couple. You're yeah. good people. <laughs> but here's another thing too, though, guys, is like your, your music could, you know, make someone feel like they actually belong. Like they actually have a family or friends that they can turn to. You know, and that's the beauty of music. It's therapy for every single person out there who feel like they don't belong or they just need escape. And I feel like this music for some people will do that. Oh, that's a huge well, thank you. Yeah, that's, that's a big deal. I think like 1692 was all about that, right? Was, mm-hmm. Like, which is, you know, persecuted for being different. You know, that album was specifically written for people who didn't feel like they belonged, you know, and I think that if we can do that with any of our music, you know, then hallelujah, you know, that's the best compliment that you can receive. Yeah. yeah I think it's something that Gwen strives for is like, you know, it's not the, I'm just going to sing about mythical darkness and creatures and stuff. I'm going to, in landscapes, I'm going to sing about hurt and pain and feeling inclusive and hoping that other people, you know, pick up on that. I do want to go to the Salem Witch Trials place. I do want to go up there and check that out because I'm huge at the That's, paranormal stuff. Huge. Yeah. It's uh it's a, it's it's both beautiful and saddening at the same time that so much, you know, terrible oh, yeah. things. Um and we like our, our video of Bright Eyes, like the with the, the ro- roller skate. I don't know, have you seen that video? There's a girl sure roller skating in yeah. Salem. So the, the house in the very beginning is they call it the witch house, but that house was owned by one of the judges that helped put mm-hmm. those people to that. So having a, a goth roller skate girl skate past her house, listening to music that would absolutely have been outlawed. Oh back yeah. Then is such a, a middle finger to that whole, you know, establishment that, that, that does persecute anyone for being different. So having her, you know, skate through Salem, jamming off to one of our songs is like, and, and the, from what I, the way I look at it, it was a pretty punk rock uh, statement. So yeah, oh, yeah. definitely get, get there if you can, because it's yeah. awesome. We've been there so many times. If I know we paint our whole, whole house black. I probably steal it, but <laughs> our house is totally black. I see that. That's awesome. <laughs> if I'm not mistaken, I thought I saw where the last witch got, though the one who supposedly the last of them got pardoned was was cleared of all that. Um, uh, I thought I had heard that or read that, and I was thinking to myself, Jesus fucking Christ, why now? I mean, yeah. why all this time? I mean, what the fuck? Yeah. People, right. people are people are crazy. Young people, people stupid people shouldn't be breeding. That's what I keep saying. <laughs> so if you do go there, um, you know, all the stuff downtown is rad, you know, all the, the normal, usual suspects, but make sure to try to go outside of town to where the foundations of the house is where the Anybody. original, it's a DVD, the original girls that started, you know, saying that their slave was a witch or whatever, that the foundation for those two buildings and how small it is, is still there. And it's just in some dude's backyard. So you can walk a trail and there's usually chickens running around. And you can go stand in there and just think all this shit started right in this little 10 by 10 square. It's like, it's pretty heavy. I know you guys had a lot of music growing up, but uh, do you still have a go-to album or a song that you find yourself going back to and listening to from time to time? You, you just cannot kick that album or song out. You've got to listen to it eventually. Portis Head Dummy. For me, that's, that's, it, it used to be the soundtrack to much melancholy. Mm. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I do some meditation, um, you know, sometimes I'll put that on to get in the mood or, you know, it's, it's one of those things that I will, I must have listened to it a thousand, if not more times. I, I don't know if I have one, I have like a handful um, and it's, it's broad. Like I like Planets Collide by Crowbar. Uh, I like uh, the Sunny Day Real Estate Diary record. You know, those are <laughs> the opposite ends of the spectrum right there. Um, this band Karma to Burn from West Virginia that disengage used to play with all the time. I love yes. them. Yes. I, I I really like a lot of the riffs from Limp Biscuit. 
<laughs> not so much the, the a lot of the vocal stuff, but the riffs are, are pretty good because it's all you know rhythm. Carter Burnham and Biscuit, a lot of similarities. People are gonna probably go deep <laughs> shit over that, but the rhythms that those like that are happening with there are very unique to each of those bands, and so that, I, you know I think that that's um, that that gets me a lot. It's more like a vibe, I think, than a a lyric telling me that things are going to be okay or something. I don't really go to music for that. It's more about riffs and and vibe uh, than you know someone else helping me with life. All right, guys, I got to know this. And Sean, I know you've been doing this for a very long time, but standing on that stage and taking that stage still to this day, do you both, and I know this is new for you, Gwen. I know this is new for you still, but do you guys still get that uh, same feeling uh, as you did when the first time you took that stage? Do you still get that anticipation and the hair standing up on your arms? Sure. Yeah, I mean, it's (laughs) going on tour is it's, my favorite thing about tour besides traveling is the fact that a couple shows in you start to hit this rhythm where you're, you're always, you know, God, we're antsy and we're all bouncing around the green room before you go on. But then when you go on stage, it's like you have this confidence that you don't really get to feel in other parts of your life that often, you know? And so once you get over the first few shows of tour, you get to do that like 15 to 20 more times in a row and you kind of know how to drive the, the night almost or your, your 30 minutes that you have or your hour that you have up there. And so that, that confidence, you don't really get that a lot in other parts. I don't experience that in, in other parts of my life. So, and, you know, now not being wasted on stage and, you know, being pretty much sober, not drinking on stage, um, I get to enjoy it and remember what it, what it is every day. So that, that's, that is you know, part of the high Glenn was talking about, you know, it's like, you, I don't know other, anything else in life. When my daughter was born, I got a crazy feeling, but you know, beyond that, like the, the hitting that rhythm on tour and playing stage is probably one of the best feelings for me. And I think if you, if you ever um, see a band as they come off stage or see a video of a band, like as they're coming up, it's still the same, no matter if you've done it once or 50 times. Did you see that guy? Did you see, did you sit here when I hit that wrong note? Oh my God. You know, I can't believe I flubbed. But it, it's, it, you, it's such, it, it's such a high. It's, it's, you can't get it anywhere else. You know, you really can't. It's just one of those things that it, it's indescribable and unless you experience it, you know, and the one thing that I am so grateful for is that I get to experience it with Sean, you know, like, <sighs> <laughs> because <laughs> what tell me more yeah please. Um, but yeah. just you know it's such a special thing and then we can you know go back to our hotel and still you know talk about stuff as we and eat snacks and eat snacks oh. yeah i was waiting for sean to go i was waiting for sean to go fuck yeah <laughs> yeah oh, yeah that's my thing <laughs> fuck yeah we do <laughs> so you guys did a cover of johnny cash's ring of fire what brought that on and why did you want to tackle that one I usually pick the covers. Sean, it, when Sean picks covers, it doesn't go as well as Is we hope. <laughs> <laughs> um, in, in a year and a half, that'll be a different situation. Any anyway. okay? So, um, yeah, I think that our label was doing like a a cover, like thing. a series where they a asked series. all their bands once yeah. a month to do a cover. And so, and it was like from the 70s or something. I think, I yeah, there was a time limit or something like that. Yeah. But so we, we didn't listen and yeah, we just picked we, Ring of Fire. We just, <laughs> we just did Ring, Ring of Fire is such a classic song. And, and it was something that was just so, I don't know, like, like Sean said, it sounds kind of like a mariachi band, you know? Yeah, and the, we're like, okay, let's fuck this up. Let's see what we can do to make Yeah. This. How do you make those trumpets sound spooky? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, so we, spent a lot of time taking that song apart and putting it back together and then trying to figure out how Gwen was going to, the music came somewhat quickly, took a few days, you know, and the arrangement we wanted, we kept the arrangement the same. I think I might've cut a couple parts out to get there quicker, but I didn't like do anything weird with the arrangement. And then Gwen's vocals took a long time on that one. Cause we had to figure out like, how do we do this? Like, how do we deliver it in a way that's like you and there's layers and a whole bunch of stuff. So we ended up with how many vocal tracks? On there? 21 vocal tracks. Good Lord. And yeah. instead of like picking a, a hero vocal that is featured and then, least, you know, yeah. we just put them all up there. Yeah. <laughs> For this one. 
so there's yeah so there's like different octaves there's harmonies there's growls there's breaths there's there's whispers. stabs too at the end right there is there a hot sauce uh, mm -hmm. never mind okay. <laughs> Sean's right um, the to-do list next time <laughs> Um, but yeah, it, it took a long time because we completely rewrote the melody. Completely, you know, just yeah, used the lyrics, but that was that was about it. Yeah, and the structure. The problem with a lot of songs that I pick is that they're from the '80s or '90s, and they are so freaking major scale that when I try to make them heavy, it just you know, Gwen's like too happy. She walks <laughs> in and she goes too happy, and she goes back downstairs, and I'm like motherfucker. <laughs> So it's like it's usually too happy because there was like a you know there's a couple of covers that I still would like to do that we you know did the bones of and she was just like no too happy because what the the song that was going to be Ring of Fire what my my goal was to have all these doom couples just like having their arms around you know being like oh my god they're playing that song <laughs> you know but uh, that was too happy so then we ended up with Ring of Fire but we're stoked though yeah. we, we we love playing it live and people sing it back and then like when new fans see us because it doesn't sound like the original they're like why do i know this oh my god that's really hard you know that happens a lot when we play live. <laughs> poor sean want to do everybody's working for the weekend and gwen's like no <laughs> oh boys of summer is sweet <laughs> <laughs> no 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 i just kidding the, Atar the ataris did it punk wise and they did a really good job at it but <laughs> you can get away with that punk because punk's allowed to be happy and have major scale stuff you can do whatever the fuck you want like but yeah, for us, it's, it's gloom, gloom says no. Gloom says no. it's a lot harder for us to to come up with a cover that works. <laughs> um, yeah. Hey, you guys need to start merchandising uh, Gwen's quote. Gwen says no, and make sure about it. There you go. That'll work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now I get enough of that in my life. I don't need anybody else. <laughs> I don't need to teach that around. <laughs> John's book of no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, folks. You want to get out and pick up Frail's new album called skin and sorrow that comes out september 23rd via aqua lamb records and i'm telling you right now get out and pick up the white witch the ep all this stuff man from from uh this band I'm, you will not be disappointed if you can't get into this stuff then there's something badly wrong with you because first time i started listening to this group i fell in love with it and uh so so damn good so damn good so how can folks stay in touch with you guys, pick this album up, tour dates, everything under the name of this band, Frail? How can they do that? So um, you can email us at info at frailband.com or you can go on our band camp, which is bandcamp. No, frail.bandcamp.com. Frail and we have a bunch of links on that. If you go to our Instagram, which is Frail Band, I think it's Frail underscore, underscore band, band, and yep. you go to that link in bio thing, it's real good. There's, everything's there. And what I'm also going to do is I'm going to put all these links in this interview before I post it. So everything is going to be listed here. So nobody can say, yeah. I know where to go get it. It's right there in the, in the bio. <laughs> Beautiful. Right, Beautiful. Before I let you guys go, would you care to do a promo for my show? Hell yeah. Sure. Hi, I'm Gwen. And I'm Sean. And we're from the band Frail. And you are watching Bod's Mayhem Hour. Everybody stick around. We got some great, great stuff coming up. You only hear these interviews right here on Bod's Mayhem Hour. Please go and check out our Facebook page. It has that podcast link and that YouTube link. And go subscribe to the freaking YouTube link. It takes two seconds, folks. Just click subscribe, click notification bell. I told you the 1,000 subscriber that comes on here, we're going to come on here and eat a bunny sandwich live. We're going to talk music. We're going to do that live. So we got to do that for me. Also, please check out The Frail. Pick up this new album, Skin and sorrow plus check out everything else this band has out there uh, you will not be disappointed check them out live september 9th at the post festival and please folks i ask of you all this go out and uh, donate to the east kentucky flood relief fund because this is my home state and it's been devastated we all need help here everybody needs help some people can't rebuild back but just donate anything five ten fifteen dollars it doesn't matter does not matter please do that and uh Gwen and Sean, thank you so much for doing this interview, and I wish you guys nothing but the best of luck because I think you guys are going to knock it out of the ballpark continuously. Thank right, you, thank so, you much. so much for having us. Yeah. You're listening to Buds. Mayhem Hour. 
Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram.